Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today we'll be reading The Wolf and the Raven, Part 1. This is from a collection of stories called 54 Sleepless Nights, written by Tobias Wade. If you like this story, there will be links in the description of this video and podcast episode if you'd like to purchase yourself a copy and support the author. I really do appreciate it. Let's get started. My name is Sarah Claver and I'm supposed to be at home in Wisconsin working on my dissertation for my biology degree. Instead, I'm freezing my ass off in a dive bar in Alaska, almost a week into the hunt for my PhD advisor, Robert Olsky. And it's not my fault there isn't an internet connection in the remote village he hid away in. I tried to be accommodating by mailing back and forth my paper, but then the letters stopped returning altogether. You could have at least called. I don't know how you got your wife to stay in this beastly place. I glared accusingly at him across the table. My arms wrapped around myself for warmth. It was so cold that the glass was frosted inside and out. The gloomy little den felt like it belonged to a wild creature. I couldn't imagine why anyone would live here unless they weren't allowed to be anywhere else. My wife is always looking out for me. Besides, you are doing fine without me, Dr. Olsky grunted, not looking up from the steaming wooden mug he clutched in both hands. His white and wispy manicured beard had grown immense and unruly in the months since I'd seen him last at the university. Two planes. Second one was held together by spit and glue, I complained. Robert chuckled and nodded, taking a long drink. I think he had clam chowder in there. Then the bus. Then I had to rent a jeep and navigate that switchback road that a caribou would have gone around. Do you think I would have gone through all of that if I didn't need you? I didn't ask you to come here. Dr. Olsky growled, wiping his beer with the back of his arm in a way that I couldn't imagine the dainty professor doing before he left. He looked exactly like the locals now, as much animal as man, but then his dark eyes darted up at me, the same old intelligent twinkle buried deep within the weathered and weary face. Why didn't you come back when you were supposed to? I felt myself growing annoyed at the bitterness in my voice. Here I was, like this was all some grand conspiracy against me, when it was clear Robert had endured some great suffering in the frozen north. You should have enough time to track every wolf in Alaska by now. Maybe I've got rabies, Dr. Olsky chuckled again, the muffled sound slowly fading as his thick eyebrows drew together in a thunderous scowl. The gray wolves are smarter than I am, though. They can smell when the land is dying, and they run from it while humans linger. I don't think there are any wolves left here anymore. Land is dying? What are you talking about? This place is as far from civilization as you can get. I didn't even know there were forests this thick in North America. But did you see any animals on your drive? Dr. Olsky asked. The pleading was in his voice now, his eyes wide and desperate as his thin neck strained toward me. Well, no, not next to the road. But did you see any footprints? Any ravens or gerfalcons nesting in the branches? Any hunters or fishermen left? Or was it just quiet. Robert's eyes slid away from me, staring over my shoulder and prompted me to turn. A man dressed in gray and white camouflage was watching us from the end of the bar, his face inscrutable behind his small, round spectacles and bushy mustache. There's one hunter left, the man said, standing stiffly and moving to join us at our corner table. Go home, Hank, Dr. Olsky said wearily. You too, Sarah. Go home and leave me be. He knows where the wolves are going, but he isn't sane, Hank said, clapping Robert on the shoulder with a meaty hand. The professor tried to lean away, but Hank held on. Aren't you going to introduce me to your daughter, old man? He added, grinning in my direction. Not my daughter. She's one of my students, Dr. Olsky began. Going all the way to visit your icy ass? Evening, sweetheart. My name's Hank Saxton, and I'm the closest thing Robert has to a friend up here. He still won't tell me a damn thing about what's happening to this place, though. Ain't that right, buddy? Robert Olsky just scowled at the hand on his shoulder until it finally dropped away. Go home, he repeated, softly into his beard. I won't help you, chasing something that doesn't want to be found. Won't or can't? Hank asked, grinning down at Robert who stubbornly refused to look at him. Maybe your student will find what you missed then. Moose, reindeer, brown bears... Doll, sheep, musk ox. I'll still see them from time to time, although not as many as I used to. The gray wolves, though, this place used to be teeming with them, and I haven't seen one for ages. They aren't just wandering off, either. There aren't no tracks leaving this place. 
What do you say, Sarah? I can show you where the wolf layers used to be, and maybe you can tell me what's been happening to them. No! The clatter of Dr. Olsky's wooden chair spinning to the floor gave me a jolt. He was standing now, mad eyes darting in every direction, as though surrounded by invisible foes. Sarah isn't a part of this. I forbid you to stay. Leave this place tonight and tell the university I'm not coming back. I put too much effort into getting here to give up that easy, I protested. Okay, Hank, you got yourself a deal. Tomorrow morning we'll check out the layers and see what we can find. That's more like it, Hank grinned broadly. So your old man's too embarrassed to admit he can't figure it out. I'm coming too, Dr. Olski interrupted fiercely. Hell of a lot of trouble you'll get into without me. Messing with things you don't understand. What's a hunter like you want the wolves back for, anyway? Don't they compete with you for game? I asked Hank, as I drove the jeep the next day. He was sitting up front with me while Robert sat in the back, arms crossed, scowling and muttering to himself. What's the fun of hunting something I can't fight back? Hank asked cheerfully. I'm in it for the sport and the pelt, not the food, and I take no pride in shooting something in the back. We're going too far, Robert grumbled behind us. We should have parked by now. You lost the right to give directions when you made it clear you stopped caring about finding them. Hank shot back. Keep on going, as far as you can before the trees get too thick. I pulled off on the side of the trail anyway, trusting Dr. Olski to know best. Fine, I don't mind the walk, Hank said, hopping out of the jeep. See the raven watching us? Dr. Olski said in a hushed tone. The large bird was tilting its head from one side to the other, evidently inspecting us from the branches of a nearby spruce tree. Ravens and wolves often hunt together up here, Dr. Olski continued. They'll lead the pack on the hunt, helping them find prey from the air, or flushing them out from the underbrush. Then the wolves will share their victory after they've moved in for the kill. Some ravens will even form close personal relationships with individual wolves, forming pairs that stay together for years on end. Hank circled around the jeep to get his long rifle from the trunk. He plodded resolutely through the trees without waiting for us, apparently sure of where he was going. Dr. Olski didn't follow, though. He was just cocking his head back and forth, watching the raven watch us. Do you think there are wolves around then? I asked nervously. Or do you think the bird is just hanging around where they used to be? The raven leapt off his branch and fluttered into the air briefly before settling back down a little farther away. Hold on, Hank. It looks like we're going this way, Dr. Olski called, moving to follow the raven. His voice was sharp and clear in the frosty air. It was loud enough to make me flinch, but Dr. Olski just smiled patiently. Don't worry about the wolves finding us. Trust me, they're all gone. The pack used to have a lair around here, Hank called back reluctantly through the thick trees. A loud caw resonated from the raven as it fluttered to another tree. Come, Hank, Dr. Olski repeated. She says you're not welcome there. Who says? Hank asked, pushing through the frosted ferns to join us once more. I stared uncertainly at Dr. Olski, unaccustomed to such cryptic statements from the professor. His eyes were locked on the raven, though, and he would have left us both behind if we didn't follow him. Then he cupped his hand over his mouth, returning the cawing sound toward the raven. He's a doctor, you say? Hank asked me. I nodded, shrugging to indicate I was as confused about his behavior as he was. We continued in this manner for some time, the raven always waiting for us to approach before launching off to the next tree. There was snow on the ground, but it wasn't thick enough to make the hiking difficult. More snow filled the branches on the trees, and the farther we went along this trail, the larger and older the trees became. Hank kept quipping that we were going the wrong way, wondering what the point of coming along with us if we didn't listen to him. I reassured him that I trusted Dr. Olski, although I must admit my faith was shaken, as the old man continued cawing back at the raven whenever it spoke to us. Presently, the mighty spruce trees began to grow more weak and sickly, with dead branches replacing the thick green ones behind us. The undergrowth around us was growing thin and dry as well, and this trend continued as we progressed until nothing but dead trees with thin skeletal branches grasped toward the pale yellow sun. Is this what you meant by the dying land? I asked Dr. Olski. He turned away from the raven we were following and stared me straight in the face. His neck quivered as though he was about to speak, but no sound came out. Curiously, he cocked his head to the side just as the bird had done, and then a squawking, croaking caw emerged from his throat, nodding to himself as though satisfied with that answer. He turned away from me again to hurry after the raven. 
I was beginning to consider changing my vote of confidence and asking Hank to lead instead when I saw small shapes flitting through the trees in the distance. Weary of the dead landscape and encouraged by any sign of life, I pushed ahead through the dry underbrush to try and identify the creatures. The raven overhead began to caw again, or maybe it was Olski, I can't be sure, but I was getting tired of both of them and pressed on. I didn't stop until I saw a rustle in the bushes directly ahead of me. The sight so close knocked me back into reality, reminding me how deep into the Alaskan wilderness I really was. I started scrambling back towards the others at once, but not before the dry brush parted to reveal the largest, most grizzled gray wolf I had ever seen in my life. Its fur was matted and smeared with ancient blood. Yellow eyes bore through me with ferocious intensity, and the parted mouth bristled with fangs as long as my fingers. The skin above its nose drew back into a snarl, and the creature leapt forward with such graceful deadly purpose that I knew instantly it would be impossible to run. I felt my body collapsed into a quivering heap without the strength to defend myself or resist in the slightest. Then, a gunshot broke the air, so close and so loud that I threw myself to the ground and instinctively covered my head with my hands. Sarah, move! Dr. Olsky shouted above me. Rough hands grasped me under my arms and hurled me to my feet, hauling me back toward where Hank was lying on the ground with his long gun. More dark shapes darting through the trees. I counted at least four as we huddled together and watched them circle us. Give them another warning shot, Dr. Olsky said firmly. Don't try to hit one, just give them a good scare. First shot wasn't a warning shot, Hank grunted. Well, you missed then, Dr. Olsky snapped. I thought he must be right because the large wolf was still standing exactly where I first saw it. Its face still warped into a feral snarl. Then the wolf began to advance, and as it moved, I clearly saw the devastating impact where the bullet had entered its body near the shoulder. Instead of bleeding, the wound looked more like someone sank a pickaxe into the ice, exploding a hole bristling with shards of frozen blood and bone. Another gunshot, but the creature didn't move. Then I realized that Hank had fired a, a second wolf, which was running along our flank. An explosion of broken shards lanced through the air, catching and spinning the light in hundreds of directions. As the creature sprinted past, in the brief silence that followed, I realized no sound emerged, even from the first snarling wolf still advancing toward us. No whimper of pain, no predatory howl. The deadly emptiness was only broken by the cawing of the raven overhead. Long, raucous notes echoing through the static moment that never seemed to end. All at once, the wolves turned and fled back through the dead forest. Hank took another shot at one of them when it first began to sprint, but he didn't fire again when it was clear they were all running away. Hank was the first of us to rise after it seemed like they were gone, and he swiftly strode through the trees to where the second wolf had been flanking us. Dr. Olski? I whispered, barely trusting myself to breathe. Those are the missing wolves, aren't they? What aren't you telling us? The professor looked me in the eye again, and the horrible, cawing sound rising in his throat made me start to violently tremble in a way that I hadn't even done when the wolf was snarling at me. A moment later, Hank returned, holding his long gun in one hand, the other holding up a bristling furry tail over two feet long. He threw the tail down at our feet, and I reeled backward from the rancid odor. Rotten through, Hank said, though it's not as bad as it would have been without the cold. That animal has been dead for a long time. Dr. Olski quietly rose, scanning the branches until he found the raven once more. Then, without a word, the old man began to jog after the bird, which promptly took flight as though begging us to follow. We're going back to town, Hank said, his voice trembling slightly. I'm not leaving Dr. Olski out here, and I've got the keys, I replied, hurrying to catch up with the professor through the dead trees. And that's the end of the story. I really hope you enjoyed part one of The Wolf and the Raven. If you did, well, you know, like, let me know. Let me know in the comments or like, you know, whatever you gotta do. But more than that, I just uh, hope you enjoyed yourself here and hope you enjoyed this story. I won't ramble on too much, but know there are things available if you'd like to come join our Discord, maybe support the channel via Patreon, all that fun stuff. But with all that said, I will see you in the next one.